Hi, my name is Holly. I'm a program manager at Edison Ford Winter Estates. And this month, we're talking about Tootie McGregor Terry. Uh, she's known for a lot of things, or perhaps not known for enough, because she accomplished a lot. And she was a lot more than just Ambrose McGregor's wife or Thomas Edison's neighbor. So let's get started by sharing the screen. And then I'll give you a little more information. And she's somebody that I um, have come to greatly admire. Tootie McGregor, benefactor of Fort Myers. And this is not a very, this is the only one I could find of this, but this was where the McGregor started out in Cleveland area of Ohio. And that's the only picture I could find of their home, but you could see it was quite opulent for the time. And one thing I don't like to do is define a woman based on her just her relationships with men, but she wasn't a person that sought after a lot of publicity. So I do tell the story of her husband and her son, but I also tell her story too, because it's a part of that. So Ambrose McGregor, her first husband, was born in 1842, and he's 17 when the Western Pennsylvania oil fields were discovered, and he and his father were making barrels for st Standard Works, and that's John Rockefeller, the famous billionaire's first refinery. And Rockefeller liked him and hired him as Standard Works operation foreman in 1868. So this is a man that didn't come from a lot of wealth. In 1874, McGregor, at the age of 32, was promoted to the superintendent of Standard Oil Refineries and Manufacturing Operations in Cleveland. And Rockefeller encouraged his close associates to take shares of stock in Standard Oil as part of their compensation. And most took it happily, including Ambrose. And this is a picture of him as a young man. And yes, they, the, many things I read talk about his Scottish background. As a result, he's one of the richest men in America when he succumbed to cancer in 1900. He'd been a Rockefeller Mandarin, one of a handful of men who worked behind the scenes at Standard Oil as a trusted counselor. His holdings in Standard Oil of New Jersey led to the development of the A.M. McGregor Home and Foundation. That's something that takes place in Cleveland. Of course, I'll talk about their impact here as well. But just to give you a little bit about the background about how the money was required, he didn't come from wealth. And I think at uh, different places I'll read. Well, let me, let me tell you a little bit about her and her sister and their background. Uh, and the one thing I will also mention is there's so much conflicting information about Tootie and what she did and didn't do and what happened. But Tootie and her sister Sophia were descended from a distinguished Cleveland family. Um, other places I've read, he was a judge. Other places I read, they, they were kind of struggling middle class or maybe a little less than middle class, but they certainly were not millionaires. Their grandfather and his brother-in-law had come to Cleveland from Connecticut when Josiah, her grandfather, was 47, to stake their claim in Western in the Western River Reserve, having acquired large amounts of property on the west side. And if you're from Ohio, I apologize for butchering this. The Yugahoga River. They started a real estate company and sold lots in the area they called Brooklyn, Ohio. In 18 36, they spun off Ohio City from Brooklyn, and Josiah Barber served as the first male elected at the age of 65. Now, the sister's father, Epaphras, did not achieve the results that his father did in an unsigned 50th anniversary of the A.M. McGregor home. And I did get that information from this website. It says, Mrs. McCroskey, which is Tootie's sister, had not known the luxuries of life. So you can see there's a little conflicting information there. Neither Mr. and Mrs. McGregor had been born into wealth. And I, I agree that that is definitely true. And the author reported that Barbara's sisters had a morbid fear of being reduced to the condition which they knew in their youth. Have I seen any documentation other than what's on their website about that? No. Uh, but so maybe or maybe not, that's true. You could take it with a grain of salt, but I don't think they came from the kind of 
Rockefeller background for sure. And you can see where I got this information from. And this is Tootie's sister. Here's the sad news for me and you is that there's only one picture of Tootie in, in existence. And this is a painting. Uh, so I'm only gonna have one picture and the painting picture of her. And they were in their early 40s, Tootie and Ambrose, when Rockefeller moved his headquarters to New York City in 1883. By then, Rock Rockefeller had created the Standard Oil Trust that controlled almost all of the oil production, processing, marketing, and transportation in the nation. And by that time, the Rockefellers had all the trappings, all what you would show as to being a wealthy person. But I don't know if it was necessarily you know, something that they were try ever tried to show off on. In fact, Tootie tended to fly under the radar, in my opinion, from what I've read. They had a summer home in uh, Mamaroneck, Long Island, and a winter home in Fort Myers. So, and, and they started out in Cleveland. McGregor's loyalty under trying conditions made him one of Rockefeller's favorites. And also that Rockefeller had known Gregor for so many years. I'm gonna fill in the Fort Myers story. I just wanted to paint the background for you. So I give a little more information from their website here. And when Ambrose died from cancer, uh, those loyal to him were loyal. The ones that he had been loyal to, they were loyal to him. And they reached out to Tootie and Rockefeller accompanied her and her husband's casket back to Cleveland in their private, their private train car for burial in Lakeview City in Cleveland. So they still maintained a connection to their Ohio roots. Tootie was 757 when she remarried, and I'll talk about that more. Her second husband was Marshall Terry, a medical doctor she'd known for many years. I question that because people try to say they'd known each other since they were children. But I, I put this in here, but I want you to know she is five years older than her husband. And there's no evidence that they were ever childhood sweethearts. So I've seen that written many places. I think either she got to know him as an adult or after her husband passed away. But he was also from the Ohio area, which could make people assume that. Uh, the ter Terry's and McCroskey's her sister and the sister's husband, and she and her husband created and incorporated the Ammon McGregor Home for Aged People. It was his official name between 1900 and 1904. It was incorporated as a charitable organization, and they built the home on the original McGregor Farm in East Cleveland, and the home's cornerstone was set in 1906, and it opened for business, and Tootie donated $5,000 a year during its first five years of operation. From 1908 to 1912, the year she died, she left the amount of cash and standard oil stock for it, and the trustees called her endowment the Founders Fund, the backbone of the Founders Fund, and this is from their website, was in fact Tootie McGregor's Standard Oil of New Jersey stock, said a longtime trustee today, of course, and I learned this, it's Exxon Mobil. So they left money for that, and now it's been um, combined with another, um, the Gardens of McGregor and Amarsa Stone opened in early 2004. It was a 1987 merger between the McGregor home in East Cleveland and the Amasa Stone, an early wealthy person that donated um, in the Glenville neighborhood of Cleveland. It offers affordable independent housing and assisted living, and, and they make grants that support initiatives in helping seniors in need and those who serve them. And I apologize if I mess this up. Piego County through the McGregor Foundation established in May 2002. So that was all Tootie McGregor, and she is the person that got that started. So let's talk a little bit about them coming to Fort Myers. Ambrose and Tootie McGregor liked to fish, and they had us um, very much, and they had a son, Bradford. And I always used to think he was a young child, but he's actually in the 20s when he was uh, quite ill. And the doctor told them they should take their son to Florida for the winter. The combination of their sick son and the passion for fishing, they went to the Tarpon House in early winters of 1891 and 1892. So Tootie, I, I, well, Mina Edison also liked to fish. So she, they were interested, she was interested in outdoor life as well. And in February, they sailed up to Fort Myers for the first time and they liked it so much, they decided to make it their winter home. And that Edison was already there, 
but he had not returned after 1886 and 1887. He's not going to come back till 1901. So I don't think that was the attraction. And it wasn't a place that was on a lot of people's radar. It was starting, it would get more publicity later on. And while looking for a suitable property, they were shown the Gilliland home. And the Gilliland home was one that Edison's best friend and business partner had built when Edison was having his home built, but they had a falling out. And so McGregor is going to rent that house. I mean, Gil Edison's rent that house out to the Gillilands and eventually it is purchased by the McGregors. And actually the Gillilands owned the house and then the McGregors owned the house. Uh, the property included the house, Seminole Lodge, the guest home, and about four acres of land. And the McGregors paid $4,000 for it. And the McGregor family moved into their new home and made many improvements. So the, what we know is the guest home. It was owned by Edison's best friend, Ezra Gilliland. But then Edison and he had a falling out over a business matter. And what happens is that Edison is going to cut off access to the pier, which you needed to get supplies. Fort Myers was rural then, to the caretaker, to water, um, everything. It made it very difficult. You'll read that um, Gilliland was busy with business interests, but it really was that falling out. And you can see that the home is under going to go, this is the early years, and it's going to undergo a lot of changes. But uh, some of the story comes from the story of Fort Myers. So there's what we would known today as the guest home. It looks a little different. And the things I found out about the McGregor's um, we have a historic structures report and some of the information that said that Ezra Gilliland had rented the home out, which was true to other people. And then he sold it to Ambrose McGregor. And the, they called their home, I'm going to say it, they both owned it. They called it Poinciana, which is a local tropical here. And the news press or the press uh, talked about what McGregor was going to do to the site. And he, completely repainted the interiors and exteriors of the building. And Thomas Edison, remember I told you, had cut off access to the pipes. Uh, so those had to be reconnected. And McGregor's also installed a windmill for electricity and an irrigation plant. Um, and there was no talk of digging a well. And the McGregor's uh, might have done a little different. You know, they maintained the house, they paint it. They might have added some lightning rods and did some small main maintenance, um, but it's pretty much like it was then, except the, the when the Edisons buy it back after selling it, because after the McGregor's, it will go to Harvey Heitman, who arranges a trade downtown with RIO Travers, and then eventually Edison buys it back from the Travers, so they get it back and they make it their guest home. So the floor plan was a little altered, but other than that, it's very similar to what it was during the McGregor's time. And of course it was painted differently. Um, and the kitchen wing is the same as it was then. And after Mr. McGregor dies, uh, 1902, Tootie McGregor decides to sell the home. They had moved there in 1892. They, she sells it in 1902. The Edisons don't come back after that falling out till 1901. So that's the only time it's going to overlap. Now, McGregor had invested heavily in the orange groves of Florida and other real estate. And Tootie is going to find happiness again. She had been through a lot, but she keeps on giving to this, this city. I'll talk a little more about that in a few minutes. But it was very hard for her to stay in that home after her husband had passed away. She missed him so much. And this is an article I found, and it was unsighted, so I'm not sure where it came from, but it kind of gave me a, a little overview to share it with you. Not that I necessarily, I always try to uh, cite what I'm using, but I couldn't on this one. But I'll give you a little information. You already know that they spent two winters down here before moving here. And he invested in a lot of property in the area and in Alva. And this says, and I don't know where they got their proof from that Tootie was actually in love with a medical student, but then she decided to marry McGregor because he is future looked brighter. I don't know where they got that from, but I thought it was a good discussion point. 
and eventually they're going to become residents here of Fort Myers. Um, and it was the Gilliland Edison uh, um, home, which I already talked about. And not only that, but McGregor did do some work. He started buying up other pieces of land and he plants citrus. And there had been a big freeze as um, in other parts of Florida. So people are thinking this would be a good place to uh, plant citrus down here. Um, he plants a hundred of 400 acres with orange and grapefruit trees and he called it Calusa and he purchased uh, 32 different parcels of land, including for his son. He was one of the 10 richest men in the country and everything I read to you or tell you about, I double check to try to get the most accurate information. So if I disagree with anything, and by the way, when they originally started staying here, they stayed at the Tarpon House in Punta Rasa, which was owned by George Schultz. And I think later on it'll become known as the Schultz Hotel. And Schultz um, has a son-in-law. I mean, has the man, Harvey Heitman becomes Schultz's son-in-law because he married Schultz's daughter. So all these things are interconnected because Harvey Heitman really got a start from Ambrose McGregor, but then it was Tootie that put him in business and um, supplied a lot of the funds. Now, as I mentioned, her son will also die, and I talk more about that. And this is the only place I've ever seen this, too, about Bradford. He had found true love, and I'll talk to you more about that in a minute, after a British first marriage and divorce, which would have been very unusual for the time. He would have been in his, I, I don't know when he got married. Uh, he'll get married again in his early 30s, but he would have been in his 20s. But he does get married again, and he, there are a bedside. It's a big, basically on his deathbed, he will marry her. And I'll tell you more about her in a minute. Um, and Judy McGregor was heartbroken. This is her only child. And she had just lost her husband in 1900. Her son dies in 1902. And she is a very civically minded person. And she's going to fund a new hotel called the Bradford Hotel. And I'll tell you a little more about that in a minute. You can see a little corner of it here in this picture. And it was opened in 1905. It has, it was only on the second and third floor and it had 41 uh, rooms and eventually that had 60 of more rooms and they added a first floor dining room and it was a very, very popular spot. I'm gonna show you pictures of it because you're gonna recognize that. And she also um, invested in the Fort Myers Hotel and there's another place that she invested in as well. Um, she puts a lot of money into the, uh, somebody had bought the Fort Ma the Royal Palm Hotel and they couldn't maintain it. It was actually a minister, so, and he was overextended. So Tootie bought that and Harvey Heitman will run that for her. And she does remarry. I'll tell you a little bit about the story about a uh, seawall. They wanted to put a seawall up along the waterfront, which makes sense when you consider the river. And it was, uh, it was $25,000 cost, which would have been paid for at $7,000 by the city. And I'll talk more about it, but other owners also um, were required to pay for it. They paid for the seawall, but there was also going to be um, like a walkway, a boardwalk, a road that would have separated them from the river. And they absolutely backed out of that. But if you read about that area at the time, it downtown, it became really dirty and nasty and slot being thrown out into the streets. And this would have just been a really nice addition, but that never happened. But the seawall was built at 350 a foot and ceremonies were held and it's 1908 with a seven shotgun salute fired from the Terry's yacht, which was called Wim. And Tootie drove in the first piling in front of the Royal Palm Hotel. And that's uh, eventually that's where she's going to live for a while. It took more than four years to complete would be no more mud in people's yards. And that's where Bay Street, they said, was also created because it wasn't there like during the Civil War era. But that boardwalk, they wanted to buy the water here. Um, never happened. But a lot of the citizens paid for that project, including Harvey Heitman and his brother. And of course, 
the Terry's as well, her sec she and her second husband. And in the last year of her life, she what she's most known for, according to some people, I'll tell you what I think she should be known for. She offered to pay for a road to be built. This was not a paved road. It was a cattle trail. It was messy. It had very narrow. It had crushed seashells and it had a lot of cattle on it. And it would be, if it would be called McGregor Boulevard on behalf of her husband, I'll talk more about that in a minute, but she undertook to uh, fund it from um, Whiskey Creek to Punta Rossa if the city and the county would pay for the rest of it. And they did. And actually that was done after her death. So, and then some people will talk, we'll talk about this in a minute, but there is a monument in her honor and where it is today. And, and what is her legacy? There's a lot. I'll tell you what I think in just a minute here. Um, so she, this is, well, let me go back to this. She, she, um, stays in that guest home from, for one more year after, two more years actually after her husband dies. And this is more what it looks like today. And in Michelle Albion's book, The Edison of Fort Myers, they said that she painted it a warm yellow with white trim. And they hired Nick Garmita to serve as the caretaker. And he took advantage of the irrigation system Gilliland used. Uh, but remember, he had cut the pipe. So I guess he must have had them reconnected. And they used seaweed. And it was just a very lush looking place. And according to Michelle's book, um, which was pretty, very well researched, the Edisons at this time, they're not back. And they really not always necessarily have caretakers that are maintaining the homes or they are on top of it. And as I had mentioned before, the um, the Terry's come and they're, they have people, I mean, the, the McGregor's come, she's not yet a Terry and they're very happy that they're there and they are investing a lot in their community. And they have their yacht that they go out fishing on called and caught a lot of tarpon, which also the Edison's like to do, but remember the Edison's aren't back that yet and they're on their yacht called the whim they broke the region's records for tarpons in that year by the way and and the investments i told you about they had citrus which i don't think really went anywhere but they just put a lot of money in it they planted trees they planted with ex experimented with planting rice coffee and tobacco so they did a lot in that area during that time period the mcgregors are becoming a big presence the edisons are not yet back yet but um, at their home, Poinciana, what happens? 1901, because I've always thought they had never actually lived side by side, but that's the year the Edisons come back. Now, Ambrose McGregor had passed away, but Tootie McGregor and her son Bradford are there, and they would eat their meals um, at the Fort, uh, at Fort Myers, the Fort Myers Hotel, and they went on hunting and fishing expeditions up the Caloosahatchee. So they all are passionate about tarpon fishing. They do get to meet up. They actually live as neighbors for a year. Then what happens? Well, let me tell you a little bit more here. There, Here's this Ambrose McGregor. I'm going to backtrack a little bit. I tell you about everything he did. Um, and he was he was just a wealthy man when he died. But this is what the heartbreak is going to be. And this is his very humble grave. And this is back in Ohio. Um, his influence was felt, but I'm going to say it's Tootie's influence because she was still here. So her husband passed away in 1900, believed it's to be a cancer of the throat. He had was valued at maybe $16 million at that time. I don't know what it would be today in today's money, but he... It was substantial. And Tootie doesn't just assist Fort Myers. She assists individuals like Harvey Heitman, who de developed a lot of the buildings down um, town and had a big influence on Fort Myers. But it was thanks to Tootie that happened. So she loses her husband in 1900. She and Bradford are here in 1901. And then what happened? 
what happens is that Tootie loses her son, Bradford McGregor. He's also buried in Ohio. And this is what it said. I mean, he's a young man in his 30s. Bradford McGregor, son of Ambrose McGregor. That's how <clears throat> obituaries were written, focusing on the male people. But she was the son of Judy McGregor. And by the way, I forgot to tell you her actual name. It's Jerusha. I don't know how, nobody seems to know how she got that nickname of Tootie. But he died at his home, country home in Mar Mamaronek, if I, and I messed that up, New York at nine o'clock Sunday night. His last hours were surrounded with romance. For on Saturday, just before his death, he was married to Miss Clara Sch Schlemmer of New York. On Sunday, an operation was performed, which resulted fatally. He died. This is from the Plain Dealer, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, Dr. Bigger and his son, assisted by Dr. Van Len and Hassler, Philadelphia, performed the operation. And he has Bright's disease, which affects the kidneys. But I believe that's one of the things in later years Edison was diagnosed with, too. Uh, but he was such a young man said he was about 30 years old. I think he was about 33, maybe, or 34. Uh, left a large fortune. His body will be brought to Cleveland and the burial, burial will take place at Lakeview. The funeral will be held on Wednesday and a sister of Mrs. Ambrose McGregor. Mrs. McClaskey resides in East Cleveland and that's the area they were originally from. And that's where they're buried with these very um, humble graves. And I wanted to share something that was uh, I was in the news press and it says White Plains, New York. This is a very bizarre thing. A heart shaped substance, hard as a stone and large as a walnut caused the death of millionaire Bradford McGregor 36 after, hours after his mage, marriage to Clara Schlemmer of Harlem, New York. And a subsequent operation for a kidney trouble is now in the possession of Dr. Hall of Maronek, who has been the McGregor family physician for many years. The stone, as it's called, weighs 20 drams. It's apparently petrified white substance covered with yellow coating. And the x-ray, which was made of the kidney, shows the exact spot where the surgeons found it. And that's what they were operating on to remove when they made incisions in Mr. McGregor's body. It was learned today that eight years ago, Mr. McGregor had been told what his ailment was, but he did not believe the diagnosis and he feared to undergo the operation. If it had been operated on, it could have saved his life, so the doctors report. The lodgement of such a large obstruction in the kidneys is something unusual today, as physicians say, and the stone will be showed at a meeting of the medical society. And then it told how much uh, money he left. His estate of nearly eight million had been settled up and the decree had been filed. And Bradford had a life interest of $300,000 in personal property. And he was worth more than a million and which his mother had also inherited. I mean, and this to me really sounded like a gossip column at the time, um, something you wouldn't hear today. I thought that was a little bizarre talking about his illness in such great detail here. And who is this? Um, Clara Schlemmler Lyle is the wife of Henry Lyle. She was born in 1979 and she marries Bradford McGregor. And she actually, um, they marry in 1902, but she will actually pass away in 1916. So she's not that old, uh, in their 40s maybe. Um, this is Bradford's widow. This is where she is buried. And she died at, at her home in New York. Her death, and this is a newspaper article, said that it recalled the romance of nearly 14 years before of her first husband, Bradford McGregor. Yes, they loved each other, but it was a tragedy. At the time, she was Clara, Clara Schlemmler. She came back for a European trip. Um, then she was going to take a tour of Europe. But then she, her fiance said that he was dangerously ill and asked if she would come back to the U.S. as soon as possible. And so she hastened to his side in September. 
and he, Mr. McGregor insisted, Bradford, that they get married, which is what happened at his home. And they were married on September 7th. And she remained continuously at her husband's bedside. And on the next day, they gave up all hope for him. Because, so you can see the story was heavily covered at the time. And she was a widow within 36 hours. And then they talk about his wealth again. And she marries seven year, again seven years later. And she's married to a doctor. And he offered her services during um, World War I near Paris. And she accompanied him there. And then she became ill in December of pneumonia that year. And she uh, died when she was in her 40s. So this is Bradford McGregor's widow. So a lot of sad things happened to the McGregor um, family, but I think that Tootie McGregor is such a resilient, strong person. What is this here? Well, this is the Bradford Hotel. It is named after Tootie's son. Uh, this is 1900 here, the big one. And I believe this is 1910. And this is the way it looks today. It had Iberia Bank in there. It has apartments, it has businesses. And uh, Tootie had Harvey Heitman, one of the founders of um, developing Fort Myers, and she invested in a lot of his businesses. Okay. Let me, I uh, think I need to go back here. Let me go back here for a minute and tell you a little bit about this. And this is a part of the original country club that was built. What happens? Well, the country club is out on Palm Beach Boulevard. And Tootie had fallen in love again and got married to Dr. Marshall Terry was five years younger than her and I'll tell you his story in a minute and there was no country club in the area so they decided to build one and they donate um, they buy about 40 acres they build a clubhouse and they think it's going to be very successful but there's lots of problems here they build that clubhouse they're building a golf course and it kind of is a mess, the area where the golf course is going to be. Um, they had some big plans for it. They built a $2,500 clubhouse, which is pretty expensive at the time. And that had a fireplace and they were gonna paint sky blue doors and locker rooms with showers and bath. And this is in that history of Terry Park that's um, published by, Lee County, you can still find it online. And they wanted tennis courts and a yacht landing and a basketball site and pro K courts and gun traps and a baseball diamond and a grandstand. And the leading contractor was Manuel, Manuel Gonzalez. And he arrived here after the Civil War and helped uh, also develop downtown Fort Myers. And an article in the news press at the time said that everything would make this place as attractive as possible. But there's problems here. And then you can see a picture of it. Um, at the time, the land was on the outskirts of town. Palm Beach Boulevard today, you'll think of as a hop, skip, and a drop, jump, but not then. And those who arrived by train, it was, took them another hour to get there. And it, if you went by carriage, it cost a quarter. And so it was just a lot of work to get there. And it wasn't very practical. And there were a lot of palmettos out there. There was sand and the country club was tough for people to get to. Um, it, the Terry sold memberships for $100 each. They wanted this to really be a happening place, a golf club, a country club, but everything was gone. And, they, and finally, they think it's ready to go in 1908. But guess what? Things were really bad. It was not yet quite finished. And they tried playing on the nine hole golf course, which was kind of a mess. And there was a tennis tournament and there was trap shooting. But guess what? It's not succeeding. It's a remote location. It's not developed properly. And 
by opening day, it was $2,000 in debt. And Tootie was one of the people that was trying to build this up. But guess what? It just was not going to be successful if people were going there, but it was considered such a long ride and it was out of town that the McGregor's Tootie, and after she passed her husband, Dr. Marshall Terry, they would have put more money into it because they believed in it. And eventually it would have been a great place to be. But at the time, it's going to go out of business. Nobody is going there. It's considered too far. And today you can go visit where it does get developed. And um, Dr. Terry was part of that. And that's the Fort Myers Country Club here off of McGregor Boulevard. And that's in 1916. And Harvey Heitman was there um, as well on that. So now we've got this place that was started to be developed, but not a lot has happened. And this is from the anniversary program. In 1919, the uh, Lee County Commissioners agreed to accept it as county property after Dr. Terry canceled the mortgage and all the stockholders donated their stock to the county. And Terry hoped that the land still owned by him would be used for an annual county fair, which they did use that land. But um, commissioners are actually gonna levy a, a millage to support a county fair. So the land is still owned by Dr. Terry, but he donated the clubhouse. And Dr. Terry in 1921 donates the land that had been a recreation facility on the property since 1906 to Lee County, and it became the county government public park for the first time. And it stipulated on the deed that it be a park and a public property granted to Lee County. And it also contained a reverter clause that stated if the trustees of Terry Park the Lee County commissioners don't use it as park and public grounds, then it reverted back to the heirs of Terry's. And I don't know if they actually had any heirs or Dr. Terry did, and they name it Terry Park. And yes, Dr. Terry donated it, but he and Tootie together started the original country club. So I like to also think it is a tribute to Tootie McGregor as well. And what's gonna happen here? Why eventually, a man that owns a pharmacy writes to all these uh, baseball spring training owners, they're actually baseball owners, asking them to come and develop. Richard O. Richards asked people to come here and they could do their spring training on this very plot of land when it really wasn't even developed and it just was being used for fairs. But one gentleman will come, that's Connie Mack. I'll be talking about him later in the winter, but that's how spring great training got their start. So one of my favorite legacies of Tootie McGregor, um, because she did marry wisely, um, she and her husband developed the country club, but Dr. Terry will go on to have it known as Terry Park. And people will say it was named after him, but I'll say it's named after his wife. And I think she would have been approved of what happened to it. So um, I'm always very grateful for that. Tragically, Tootie Sergeant Barber Terry, who was born in October of 1943, died in 1912. And she's buried in New York with her husband and son. But she had married again and she had a little happiness for a few years. I believe they were married for about seven years. And I'll talk more about uh, how they met when we get over here later on. We actually don't, I'm not going to talk about how they met. We don't know how they met, but maybe they both were, they were both living in New York at the time. He was originally from Cleveland, but they, that's my guess is what, when they met there and they both come here to Fort Myers. And after that one year that she lives in her home next to the Edisons, and before that, she lived with her husband. When her son dies, she moves into the Royal Palm Hotel because Harvey Heitman ran it, but she invested in it. And so then her husband was left a widower and he had married for the first time as well. And this is from the Fort Myers News Press. And this is a bust of Tootie McGregor that was created as a tribute to her by Don Wilkins um, as well. And here is the statue that her husband um, had created. 
Dr. Terry had a monument built for $5,000 and erected in her honor at the downtown intersection of McGregor Boulevard, Cleveland Avenue, Anderson Avenue, Main and Carson Streets, and that where it was. And the Five Points area, as it was known, became the Fountain Exchange. There was a granite fountain with a royal palm tree statue embellished with the five copper snakes. I don't have an answer to the snakes there. That spouted water into a monument basin that was often used by passing buggies, horses as a watering hole. Um, and Robert Halgram, who was the original curator of this, said at the time, there were no more than a dozen automobiles in the whole um, area and most people were traveling the sand. And because Tootie McGregor had spearheaded that campaign, as you know, to pave the road, which we'll read different places, it was $115,000, but it was $150,000 for her part. But that whole area got paved and it was named for Ambrose McGregor. And that bus was created by Don Wilkins, the one that I showed you there. And he only had one picture to work from. I told you that's the only picture we have with her. And eventually this uh, 41 was developed and they couldn't leave that and the horse and buggies are gone. So they have to move it to the Fort Myers Country Club area, which were now the Edison restaurant is there. Um, and on the mo monuments plaque, it says, it's basically in a, memory of Tootie McGregor, there's a quote there that says, I only hope the little I've done may be an incentive for other people. And I think she did a heck of a lot. And she invested her money in Fort Myers, which was only her winter home. And, and by the way, uh, and there's another picture of it, when the road excavation was being done for the whole road, um, excavators working on Swords Island off the southwestern tip of Cape Coral uncovered 103 skeletons from the 150 foot long ridge. <clears throat> and when they never quite knew where those came from. <clears throat> Excuse me. But the road is completed in 1915, three years after Tootie's death, and it's named after her. And there it is at the country club. And there were snakes. Um, I thought at one part were recreated. I'm not sure. I haven't looked at this in the last few years, if it's still there. But remember, Tootie uh, established a lot here in Fort Myers. And there's that's from the news press. There's a picture of McGregor at Whiskey Creek in 1916. And it's called a macadam road, which I looked up, and it's more like an asphalt road, not our terror islands. But the one thing she said was that 1912, when she agreed to fund part of it, and she get made, donated $5,000 for five years, was that no cows could be on the road any longer because they, she was afraid it would destroy the road. And some people attribute that to being the end of the cattle industry but i think with the development of many roads that was inevitable as well but she was an inspiration for that first paved road and by the way when i talked about terry park i wanted to show you the end results of what they started wasn't what they planned it was going to be a country club but what is there is terry park and it was at the home of not only the Philadelphia Athletics, but the Cleveland Indians, Pittsburgh Pirates, and the Kansas City Royals. And if they had done upgrades, it would have been other ballparks, uh, other baseball teams, but it's still a ballpark. We have um, a old fashioned baseball game there every year. Uh, Roy Hobbs college teams come there. So I thank Tootie not only for the road, but I'm saying she helped with that ballpark. This is Edison Ty Cobb, who was with the Athletics and Connie Mack in the early years of Terry Park. And there's Tootie's second husband, Dr. Marshall Terry. 
whom she married five years after the death of her husband. And people will say a lot of different things about him as well and his background, but there he is with Thomas Edison. And he's the man that keeps on keeping her dreams alive. And this is a picture of him in uniform from Case Western Reserve. And a lot of websites say that he was the Surgeon General of the U.S. during the Spanish-American War. Um, that was offered to him, but he turned it down because he actually uh, was the Surgeon General of New York during the Spanish-American War time. And before, I think this is a couple of years before that, it was an honorary title. He didn't actually go off to war. but he was certainly very active and he is a medical doctor there in New York as well. And he still stays invested in, and stays um, in touch with Fort Myers. And by the way, um, McGregor's, they put in the most money for those seawalls, not even the McGregor's, it's the Terry's by that point, almost $4,000. I told you about that, that facelift. And he was here for several years. He just didn't come the last two years of his life. And this is where this is from. They have all his papers, Case Western Reserve. And Dr. Terry will eventually remarry. But he stays active here till two years before his death. Here's a couple of things. This is from the Brooklyn Eagle. It says six physicians were trying to save his life as he was seriously ill. This is in November of 1931. At that point, he was with his wife, um, I think it's Annabelle. He had remarried at some point within 12 years of Tootie's death. And they had also had a home in California, so New York, California, and here in Fort Myers. And by the way, he had Tootie buried next to her family in Ohio, her first husband and her son. And here's an article from the news press that said prominent Californian Florida capitalist was in serious condition in his hotel, suffering from over fatigue. Um, and actually at one point, I but I couldn't get the article from the New York Times unless I paid for it. It said that he had suffered like a nervous breakdown according to his wife but he was thought very highly here, just like Ambrose, like Tootie had been as well. And here's where he is buried, also in Ohio, next to his, his wife, Ada Bell. He has extensive mess, um, holdings here, and he was listed in Fort Myers in the news press. It said he was one of the great benefactors here and he had suffered a stroke the last two years of his life. He still owned the Royal Palm Hotel, which he had acquired from Mrs. McGregor, and they invested money in that. And he was a very wealthy man with 10 million to 12 million of his own. And there were no children by um, his either marriage that he had. And I don't know, I think his money must have been at it ended up to his wife and then to charity. We're not quite sure. Um, he does have a big uh, service out in California. And he is very high, thought highly thought of. And this is where he's buried. And that is the legacy of McGregor's and Tootie McGregor and her husband who carried on her interest and one thing I, I always ignore um, annoys me is when I read about her, they'll say things like large boned, or they talk about her only in connection with her husband's, which uh, I, I've done as well. But I want to note that we don't usually describe men that way. But I also want to say that she created her own legacy here. And it was just to fill in the blank parts that I had that I um, shared about her husband's and her son's. And all the tragedies that she also suffered. To me, she's an amazing man, a woman, excuse me, that deserves a lot of credit for what she did here in Fort Myers. 
um, tomorrow for our Step Into History Digital Edition. Please join my co-manager, Ryan Boyer. His, I lost some of my graphics. I did something goofy a few days ago. But Ryan has done a tremendous amount of research for a few months and amazing graphics. And he's talking about Edison and the stock ticker, but there's so much more. Please join him. And both mine and Ryan's presentations will also be on YouTube. And um, the last thing I want to say is next month on January 10th, um, Bailey, historian Bailey is going to talk about Victorian era of beauty. And will you be glad that you weren't around then for this? Uh, it says, beauty is pain, a look back in the 19th century trends. Join her on January 10th at 1030. It's on our website. And somebody else I greatly admire, mine will be on January 16th, Harriet Tubman, the Underground Railroad and her Florida Connection. Um, we appreciate your support. If you ever have any suggestions um, or recommendations, email me, hschafer at edisonford.org. I appreciate your support and uh, thank you for the feedback, Dwayne Schaefer. Of course, no relation to me. Um, thank you for joining us. Join us next month. I'll see you then. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.